Welcome, you're watching David the Real Mad Wyatt, and this is going to be a book review of St. Justin Popovich's, Popovich's, Popovich's Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ. Uh, this is, I usually don't read 20th century, 21st century, 19th century people. Generally, I don't read them. It's not really because I don't like them per se. They're all saints. They're all part of our church. They're all, they're all diamonds for us. They're all very valuable and important. Uh, it's just that I've been focusing too much on early Christianity. Is the reason. And before I start, this is for this is for the old boys. I'm opening the camera now. This is for the old boys. I look like a I look like a monkey that just got out of the jungle recently. Let me just enlarge myself. There we go. Look like a mon actually the camera quality doesn't look like but a very important person has come back to assist me and aid me in my long talks. This is not a live stream, but this is a long talk, and he has come here to aid me, and that is Mr. Water. Mr. Water, I had him. He was staying in my university campus. I couldn't get my stuff back from the campus because, you know, the Rona and all that. So I had to wait a couple months to. To get that, get all that stuff back, and I should probably, I should probably cut my hair, maybe I don't know. But to get back on a topic, Mister Water has been our greatest ally. He's our greatest ally, and today he is going to assist us with liquid sustenance. Hello, say hello, Mister Water. Hello, everyone. I miss you guys. We don't make him talk too much because he's an idiot. But anyway, I'm going to close the camera off now. Uh, <laughs> as a... Oh, yeah. I'll, this is, again, going to be a long talk. I took a lot of notes. A lot of notes are going to get scrapped because they're either too long or I won't be able to understand them while I'm doing the talk. But anyways, before I start, I want to talk about some stuff. Um... Well, actually, before I even start about that kind of stuff, because that was going to be about the video, my Twitter got banned today. I I went to sleep at 8 a.m. Yes, by the way, I have a very bad... I have a vampire sleep schedule, but that's beyond the point. I went to sleep at 8 a.m. I woke up, I checked Twitter, and I'm suspended. Um, so I'm not going to... I don't think I'm going to be on Twitter. I'm appealing for a... Sus I'm appealing the suspension. I'm... Maybe it will work. I'm going to I'm going to tell them, "Hey, you know, I did nothing wrong because I got suspended because I called a vignat a the R word." I want to say it on YouTube now, but before I unless I get I want to get banned by YouTube now too because got to watch myself. But I called him the R word, the R tard word. You know what, I, what you know what that word means. And he is a vignat and he was saying he was, he really warranted being called that. I'm going to tell you that. He really deserved being called that. But yeah, uh, I lost my Twitter. If you don't, if you don't care about Twitter, if you don't didn't follow me on Twitter, then you know you don't really care about that. So I'm not gonna spend too much time pondering. It's just I'm just kind of surprised that I'm suspended on Twitter. It's a uh... so if you guys are Twitter heads, here's what you can do. Okay, this is for the Twitter heads here, and I'm gonna tell them until I get my account back. Share this video. Share this video around. Retweet other people sharing this video. Tell people to watch this. Be, you know, fill in the gaps for me. <laughs> uh, I will be, I will be, I will appreciate it if you did that. And as I said, it's kind of difficult to talk for a, for a long time. <coughs> Before I also start, I want to make some preliminary remarks about this book. This book is, it's not, it's not a Christology or Tridology or whatnot. It is primarily about Christ himself and his relation to the world in the form of the church. That is what this book is primarily about. It's about asceticism. It's about virtues. It's about a lot of different things. It's about... This book is a collection of multiple articles by St. Justin Popovich. And a lot of these articles cover different aspects that I haven't really covered in this channel before. 
which is one of the reasons why I decided to really make this video is because I haven't really covered any of any of this stuff before. And so this is a good opportunity. And I will also like to announce that there will be two videos going to be highbrow, high IQ stuff coming out. We're going back to that kind of stuff. I'm kind of a hiatus on that. There's kind of a hiatus on that. But they're coming back. <clears throat> one of them is going to be on hypostasis and Christology. And the other one is going to be on... It's going to be a Bible commentary. But it's not going to be my Bible commentary. It's going to be the Bible commentary of a church father. Not going to reveal, that, reveal who that is. Having announced all that, let's begin. I talked for five minutes already. I mean, people probably stop watching this. Should probably make a timestamp thingy. It was a bit intro where I talk about stupid stuff. And this is the part where I talk about the actual stuff. Anyways, let's begin. Finally, let's begin. I, I've been talking too much. Um, I'm going to be showing some screenshots. There's no PowerPoints. Let's begin. So, uh... Actually, before I even move on, I also want to comment on one statement that St. Justin regularly makes that I think some people get confused. And that is the divine human theanthropic person. Um, this is something that comes up, and I am going to be making a video on this, but this is something that constantly comes up where it's a debate on composite hypostasis of Christ, whatever, whatever. This debate pops up sometimes and people get confused saint justin regularly says that christ is a divine human person this is a completely orthodox statement term it's, it's a completely orthodox term but in the same sense that christ's body is a temple and christ dwells in his temple language is orthodox it's the same way it's the same way because it is very liable to misunderstanding, right? It's very liable for a misuse of that terminology. So divine human person is acceptable insofar as we understand that he's, a, he's divine and he's human, right? He's 100% God, 100% man. And so in that sense, you can say he's a person. If you were talking about person in the sense of who he is in terms of the ego, that's a different story. But that's not what St. Justin is talking about. He's talking about the human nature is manifested in the person. You can say that's a composite personhood in that sense, in that language. He's, as Demetrius Patrilos will refer to, he's referring to the material hypostasis of Christ, not the personal hypostasis the way we usually talk about. So a lot of people get confused. And I just want to note, I just want to make a small note on that. I'm already having a headache from talking too much. I'm sorry, but give me a couple of seconds. I think my nose is blocked, and that's why I can't speak properly. But I want to start with this page. Self-knowledge, the idea of self-knowledge. St. Justin Popper says self-knowledge is about knowing Christ, and Christ is in you, right? So the ever-living personality is God, human Christ, is precisely the church. And so the mission of the church is not some vague, let's make everyone believe the same thing, but the mission of the church is to make every one of her faithful, organically, in person, one, united with the person of Christ. And how do we get united with the person of Christ? Through the sacraments, that's one of the things. To turn their sense of self into a sense of Christ. So instead of our ego, it's not even ego death, but transforming our ego into Christ's ego. This doesn't mean that we become prelistic, prideful idiots that go out the street uh, and like act like we're Jesus Christ. No, that's not what we do. But instead, we let Christ transfigure our personhood. And instead of knowing ourself in that sense, we know Christ who becomes ourself. Another page that I want to get at the next page is that St. Justin Pop, which I'm not going to read the whole page, so I'm going to spare you that. I made some notes that you might want to pause and read. I'll give the TLDR for, for the important sections of this page. But St. Justin talks about the universality of the church, and he criticizes certain national, national churches for, um, for being national institutions rather than Christ institutions. 
And he even says that this is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit to turn the church into a mere national institution. I think this comment applies to a lot of different churches today. I'm not going to name them, but I think it applies to a lot of churches today. This, this very precisely applies to them. And he uses the, the Bible verse, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. Did we see this quoted all the time? St. Justin Popovich quotes it the correct way. Because in the context of church, we are all one. We are not national institutions. One thing that bears in mind uh, that I have to, I, I've just remembered now is that on Twitter, you know, one of the criticisms that Roman Catholics levy against us is Orthodox are too national, you know, they're national churches, which is not true, but they're national churches. That's what they are by design, right? They're, it's right in the sense that it's misused by certain people. Yeah, but that's not what it is by definition. Okay, but I say it is by that by definition. And then I look at Oriental Orthodox and they say, they say they are too united. <laughs> They're not national enough. They're talking about, you know, I won't, you know, I will avoid visiting like a Syriac person talking. About, I will avoid visiting an Ethiopian church because look, um, that's not my church. Wait, 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 wait a second. Oh, wait, 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 it's not my church. You are in communion with them. You can't say that. It doesn't make any logical sense. I don't even think it's definitionally that way, but some people take it that way. When I seen a person say we should not adopt Byzantine style autocephaly language. And then I say, you can never win with these people. And he gets mad. And that's the opposite of what I was saying. Bro, you're you're complaining about our system. Um, and then you're complaining that I find it funny. I don't know. It's it's strange. People are strange. But as you know, I got banned on Twitter, so whatever. <laughs> it is a fundamental error to have God, human organism of the church divided into little national organizations, right? In the course of their procession down through history, many local churches have limited themselves to pure nationalism and nothing beyond that. So the church has adapted herself to the people when it, sh it should be the reverse. Thank you, St. Justin. Thank you. And this doesn't only apply to in the concept of nationalism, which we don't have any problem with. But if you are trying to replace anything in the world with replacing that thing in the world with what, it, what is divine, okay, that's the part where we have a problem, you see. That's the part where we have a problem. And this could be any good thing that is worldly by design. If you replace that with what the mission of the church is, you are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's what St. Justin says. And so you should adapt yourself to the church, not the church adapting to you. And this is a very fundamental statement by St. Justin. This applies to various different things, not just this topic, various different things. It is now the high time, the 12th hour time for our church representatives to cease being nothing but the servants of nationalism. Uh, and for them to become bishops and priests of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the mission of the church given by Christ and put into practice by the Holy Fathers is this, that in the soul of our people be planted and cultivated a sense and awareness that every member of the Orthodox Church is a Catholic person, a person who is forever and ever and is God human, that each person is Christ and is therefore a brother to every human being, a ministering servant to all men and all created things, this is the Christ-given objective of the church. Any other is not an objective of Christ, but of the Antichrist. For a local church to be the church of Christ, the church Catholic, this objective must be brought about continuously among our people. So notice, St. Justin does also shy away from using the, the Catholic term. He regularly uses it because that's part of our official name, Orthodox Catholic Church. That is really, you could say, the more official term uh, the more official usage of or or name, the Orthodox Catholic Church. That doesn't mean that we are the Roman Catholic and Orthodox simultaneously. That is ludicrous. I mean, so many people get stuck up on names, which is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. All right, I'm sorry, but give me a breather because 
I've been talking too much. I'm not getting any oxygen in my brain. And I got to get some. I got to get some, you know. All right. Let's move on. So St. Justin Popovich. <sighs> oh, I don't know why when I speak, I think I sometimes forget to breathe because I'm my, 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 my head starts hurting. The next, which is not going to be a page, but this is going to be a long and a, and a huge section that I want to focus on in this book. And it's going to be about the five ascetical virtues that is according to St. Justin Popovich. The five main ascetical virtues that St. Justin talks about. And um, I'm going to be summarizing them. Again, if you want to read the book for yourself, go ahead. I recommend reading. I recommend you read it. The five ascetical virtues. Number one, faith. Faith is the number one ascetical virtue, and faith is not only belief. We're not only, only be, we're not only talking about belief, but we're also talking about right belief, orthodox faith, and not only right belief, but you should only have also have knowledge on the faith. If you don't have knowledge, if you don't know who you're worshiping, then what is your faith to, in that sense? And so, faith, the ascetical virtue of faith covers more than just belief in God, but right belief in God, full belief in God. This does not mean that we become Roman Catholics and we autistically try to tinker with every small thing. That, that's not what we do. But whatever we can know, we try to know as much as possible about God. For why should we not try to understand our Creator and who He is? Of course we should know him. Number two virtue. Prayer and fasting. I, I, th I think you guys should take notes of this. Prayer and fasting. Fasting I will focus on specifically. Because fasting cleanses our soul and our defilements. So does prayer. So the function that they take is that it cleanses our soul from worldly. Um, not going to say stain but passions. It stains our soul from passions. It stains our it, it cleanses our soul from worldly passions or worldly mode and it helps our body and soul ascend to a higher mode of being, which is the spiritual mode of being. By doing so, we move away from the world. That's the second ascetical virtue. Number three, love. What is love? Love is not wanting to have sex with another person. If that is what you believe, then you are a pedophile. If you remember my, uh, if you remember my book review on Bronze Age Perverts, Bronze Age Mindset, I make this point that if if love to you means wanting to have sex with someone else or impure thoughts like that, then you are a pedophile. You're a pedophile because you're gonna have love for your own children, and if that's the only conception that you have, you you wanna, you know. You want to do that. You're, you're a sexual deviant. You're a filthy person. Love isn't also just some vague thing as well. There's two types of love that we see in the modern world, and both are sat satanic in origin. Number one, I talked about having wanting to have sex, right? Oh, I want to have sex with this person, therefore I love. Or I want to hold their hand, therefore, like, yeah, I want to do, I want to do uh, things that a couple will do with them. That's not love, right? But it's, it's also, the, the second form is this vague sense of love. It's like this, um, what's the best way of describing? But you, you kind of understand, it's, it's vague. It's like, oh, you know, we should love everyone, man. Like, we should all love because what does that mean precisely? For a lot of them, it means tolerating what they do. It's about letting them do what they want because they associate love with not wanting to prevent them from what they're doing. Um, for example, if you say homosexuality is a... Um, uh, whatever. If, almost, if, you, if you want to say that homosexuality is an abomination, it's a disgusting, 
horrible thing. They will tell you, you're not, that's not loving. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. How is that not loving? How is that not loving? Oh, uh, because you're criticizing him, right? So people associate critique with hatred. That is not so. That is not so. This is a demonic, satanic understanding of what love is. What love is, according to, to the Christian faith, true love is wanting the best for every single person. What is the best thing that can happen for every single person? For them to go to the kingdom of heaven, for them to be deified in Christ, for them to be like God, for them to attain the virtues, for them to be in the kingdom of heaven. That is love. Love is being crucified and wanting the best for the people that is crucifying you. Love is being spat on you and then looking at the people spitting on you and say, may you attain the kingdom of heaven. May God bless you. That is what true love is. Not this vague new age nonsense, idiotic retardation. Not, not that. But true love is the love of Christ for mankind. So St. Justin, I'm going to quote St. Justin. He says, This God human love must be cultivated in our people because its Catholic character is what sets it apart from other self-proclaimed and relative loves that are the Pharisaic sort, the humanist, the altruistic, the nationalist, and likewise from animal love. The love of Christ is, is an all-embracing love always. By prayer it is acquired because it is a gift of Christ. Now the Orthodox heart prays with intensity, Lord of love, this love of yours for everyone and for all things, give it to me. Give this love to me, O Lord. And there's more to say about this. I'm not going to stand more. And I'm going to move on to the, the, the fourth ascetical virtue, humility and meekness. What, is it, what, is it, what does humility and meekness mean? Well, pride is the root of all sin. And when it's left unchecked, it will be your demise because it's self-deification. It's not allowing God de to deify us. It is us deifying ourselves in our own mind. It's schizophrenia. Pride is schizophrenia. Because it's creation of the new world where you base yourself as the God of the new world. That is what pride is. Pride is making yourself into replacing yourself with God. We shall consider ourselves instead of being the highest creature, the, not even a creature, but the highest form, we shall consider ourselves as the lowest creature. Not even the lowest of all human beings, but lowest of all creation. That is what we shall consider ourselves as, because it is God who ultimately keeps us alive by our grace. This is a virtue. The, the moment we refuse humility is the moment we start to try to be independent of God, and the, tr the moment we try to make ourselves into God. Now, um, one of the other arguments, not Saint, I don't think St. Justin makes this argument, but I see fathers make this argument, is that these virtues, God possesses these virtues too. So, for example, humility, God is humble. I mean, how is the incarnation not the most humble thing on earth? How is it not a show of humility? I thought someone was around my house. We have people visiting us. My, all right, we do have someone visiting us, but I'll still keep on going. So that is number four, humility and meekness. Number five, patience and humility. So humility appears twice here, but patience and humility, number five, ascetical virtue. Patience is important because it is about being patient towards evil, not responding to evil with evil reflexively. For if you do that reflexively, is an aspect of pride, anger, and haughtiness. Oh, dang. I wonder who needs to hear this. Probably me. <laughs> um, this is the reason why Christ said we shall turn the other cheek. Christ is telling us to be patient. So that is the fifth ascetical virtue. These ascetical virtues are very important to, to combat heresies such as atheism because theology and spirituality are both interconnected. So we cannot separate spirit we cannot separate the virtues with 
the, the, the knowledge and understanding of God, theology. And nor can we also ally, St. Justin says, we cannot ally ourselves spiritually, just like theologically, we cannot spiritually ally, align ourselves with Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, because it is their theology and spirituality that, that is foreign and leads to atheism. So we cannot... If we say that we have the same theology, we also say we have the same spirituality. Those these both are connected. And if you have this, and if both of them are the same, then what was the point of the schisms? What was the point of the separation? And that means we were all wrong, right? So this kind of a, and Saint Justin has a huge commentary on ecumenism, which I will not be talking about in this video. I think I will be making that a separate video in and of itself because the whole thing is just a gold mine. But St. Justin Pope of Cheer says, Orthodox says the single vessel and garden of the perfect and radiant person of God, human Christ, is brought about exclusively by this exertion of virtues by grace. True, entirely God, human Orthodox means not true borrowings from Roman Catholicism or Protestantism because the latter are forms of Christianity after the pattern of the proud European being and not of the humble God, human being. St. Justin also says that Orthodox asceticism is the only missionary school. It is a true missionary work that we can partake of. Asceticism. The ascetics are Orthodoxy's only missionary, says St. Justin. Asceticism is her only missionary school. Orthodoxy is ascetic effort and it is life. And it is thus by effort and by life the, the mission... This is not copy paste properly, but theanthropic mission, I believe, theanthropic mission is broadcasted, brought about the development of asceticism. This ought to be the inward mission of our church amongst our people. This is not copy pasted properly. I don't know. I don't know why. Damn, I already drank half of it. But yeah, that is. We got more about asceticism virtues. Um, but I want to show this page. I want to show you guys this page. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but St. Justin argues, he makes a connection between Christ's life, the acts of the apostles, and the lives of the saints. So he, he says that, first of all, he talks about the term Christian. He says the term Christian means Christ bearer. So it means that you bear Christ in you. And, and when, I, when I saw this, the first thing that came to my mind is Nestorius' term, Christotokos, bearer of Christ. And one of the reasons why that, that this term is not acceptable because, is because we're all bearers of Christ. And this is one of the arguments St. Cyril of Alexandria used, is that we're all bearers of Christ. That, that's what Christian means. So all you're saying by Christotokos is that you're just saying Christ, you're just saying the Virgin Mary is Christian. You're not saying anything more than that. And that's one of the significant problems with the Nestorian term Christotokos that Calvinists, who are really Nestorians, use at the same time. The saints are those who perfectly bear the life of Christ in them, meaning that the life of the saints, the life of the saints is the life of Christ, and the saints imitating Christ, apostles, and the other saints is the continuation of Christ's life on earth after the book of Acts. So, Christ's life, Acts of the Apostles, Lives of the Saints, they're all connected. It is Christ's life that we start being recorded in the Bible. And it's the Acts of the Apostles, recorded by St. Luke. And one of the points of the book of Acts is that it doesn't end. It doesn't end after the last chapter. The book of Acts continues even today. Today, the book of Acts still goes on. Year 2020, book of Acts is still progressing today until the end of times. And the book of Acts has now become the lies of the saints. The lies of saints have become the book of Acts. And so if you if you want to read more of the book of Acts, look at the lives of saints. Are you going to be, be able to read every single act? You're not going to be able to because there's so many. And that is what was meant, that if we recorded every single thing that Christ did, we will not have enough papers, it will not be enough. Doesn't the scripture say this? It will not be enough to record this. Same principle. That is why the Acts of the Apostles 
is an attempt to do that. And now let's go to the next next section. I hate doing this, but I need to I need to take a breather. I need to I need to take a couple breaths so I can so I don't faint while I'm talking. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So before this page. He says, living by Christ, the saints can do the works of Christ, for by him they become not only powerful, but all-powerful. So the saints share in the work of Christ. As St. As Paul says in the letter of Philippians, I can do all things in Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And in them is clearly realized the truth of the all true one, that those who believe in him will do his works and will do greater things than these. Christ says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Shall he do. So when we see Protestants say, You pray to the saints. You, you pray for their intercessions. And one of the things that they say is that, Well, are they going to be able to listen to your prayers? I mean, they're just in heaven. They're just chilling, man. That's what they think. They think they think the saints. What do they think? What What do these people think? These pe these debased people, who cannot think outside of the worldly paradigm. What do they think? What do they think? They think the saints are just chilling, man. They're just like relaxing and like eating fruits and like relaxing, dude. Which is really no different than what Muslims think. It's just Muslims are more de are even more debased. But they think, oh, they're just chilling, they're just relaxing, you know. What are they going to do? What are they going to Well, they're going to intercede for us. And one of the reasons why they intercede for us is because they're close to us. Okay? They're close to God. They have more favorite God. If you read the Old Testament, just read the Pentateuch. Read, no, look at the times when God says, I will destroy mankind, I will destroy Israel. And then Abraham, for example, let's take Numbers 14, if I remember correctly. Abraham intercedes for Israel. And God says, I'm not going to destroy Israel because of your intercessions. So if Abraham's intercession works, then it still works today. It's not really that difficult. And if Abraham's intercessions work, then so do many people, many saints that are in God. Their intercessions work also work it's really not rocket science at the end of the day it's really not rocket science but only debased people will scoff at saintly intercessions that's all i'm going to say um, <clears throat> but more on and truly the shadow of the apostle peter healed by a word saint mark the ascetic mood and stopped a mountain when god became man then divine life became human life Divine power became human power. Divine truth became human truth. And divine righteousness became human righteousness. Everything which is God's became man's. And so they ask, how can they hear your prayer? Like how God can hear our prayers, dummy. Because they share in God's power. Because they have become righteous. And if you think that's crazy, read the Bible, idiot. It's in the scriptures. It's not even something, it's not even out of scripture. It's in the scriptures. And um, this is in Christology, it's the principle we call communicatio idiomatum, exchange of properties in Christ. This is, this is the logical conclusion of that. So notice how you can't have that within a story in Christology. You can't have that within a story in Christology. Just want to note that. Here's a quote from St. Justin to, to move on. Um, and this holy truth about the God-man, do not the lives of countless saints most evidently and experimentally bear witness to it. Do not the lives of saints bear witness to it. For the saints are saints by the very fact that they constantly live the entire Lord Jesus as the soul of their soul, as the conscience of their conscience, as the mind of their mind, as the being of their being, as the life of their life, and each one of them together with the holy apostle loudly proclaims the truth in Galatians 2.20. Yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. 
And St. Paul says in, in the first epistle to Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. St. Justin also says that the lives of the saints are an application of dogma. So they're not just stories or myths outside of the context of theology. Theology is not just mental masturbation. But the lives of the saints, what, what theology is, in theory, lives of the saints is the application of that theory. Thus, they are the practice of dogma, whereas theology is the theoretical understanding of church dogma. That's what I wrote. St. Pop, St. Justin says, ethics is applied dogma, thus to uh, no orthodox ethics. One must look to lives of the saints. St. Justin also says, there is no passion, no sin for which the lives of the saints do not show how the passion or sin in question is conquered, mortified, and uprooted. So if you're struggling with a sin, turn to the lives of the saints. That is where you're going to see that. That is where you're going to see the application of how we conquer sin or what even is sin in the first place. Every kind of terrible people have been shown in the lives of the saints where they have by repentance become incredibly holy people. So repentance is what can, what can turn you from the son of a devil to the, a son of God. To a son of God, not the son of God, by the way. Um, all right, I'll take I'll take a I'll take a water break. Give me thirty minutes, 30, 30 seconds, thirty minutes, thirty seconds. And while I take a take a break, just think about what I just talked about. Think about all of this stuff. All right. Well, I'm back. I'm back. I'm ready. I'm energized. Let's go. So, review what we just talked about because we're going to be changing topics. We're going to be changing the gears here. We're going to be talking about education. And St. Justin, uh, let me get up. St. Justin, in his understanding of education, I think is very, very wise. Um, he, 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 he categorizes two distinct educations, two distinct models of models of education. That of the atheist secular humanist and that of theanthropic divine education. And so, for example, lives of the saints is an aspect of divine education. He says education and training is nothing other than the extension of holiness, the radiance of holiness. The saint sends forth life. Light, on account of this, he enlightens and educates. So the lives of the saints is what educates us. Dogmas educates us. True education is, in fact, the saint. Without the saints, there are no true teachers and educators. So I'm not a teacher, okay? I'm not a teacher. I'm not a true teacher because I'm not a saint. I point you to the saints. Like in this video, Saint Justin Popovich is a saint. He is a true teacher. True, true, blah, 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 blah. He's a true teacher. And that is what you should take your advice from. He is who you should take your advice from. Uh, so this is an aspect of divine education. The saints, because they are sanctified and illuminated by the Holy Spirit, are true teachers and educators. So why are the saints teachers? It is because of the Holy Spirit. In contrast, humanistic education, there is no guidance by the Holy Spirit. It is not guided by God. So how? why are you going to get your education from something that is not guided by God? And this is a huge critique of modern education. Our teachers today are all nonces that are not guided by the Holy Spirit. Not even close. And I'm not using it in the Pentecostal sense. They don't even guide you to there. They don't even guide you anywhere. They, all they do is teach you how to deify man. That is, at the end of the day, what secularistic, atheistic education does. No matter what they, what, they, what they tell you, it is all about teaching man to be, teaching man to replace God. 
Towards this direction, humanistic education occupies itself with the creation of the new man. The plan for this new man is simple. Christ or anything of Christ cannot exist in the new man. And Europe applied itself to the task and began to create the new man without God, society without God, humanity without God. And we've seen what happens when you move away from that, when you move away from divine education to the base low secular atheistic education on this uh, on this point i also want to read a a section from saint justin on this book in this, in this book this quote is Rousseau took many things from nature and introduced them to man. The following question quickly arises. What constitutes the nature of man? The senses answers the empirical philosophy of Locke and Hume. The entire nature of man is derived from the senses and is summarized in the senses. When that which is not essential for man is subtracted from him, only the senses remain to define who he is. The man who is essentially defined by the senses is very primitive and boorish. For this reason, rationalistic philosophy under the leadership of Descartes and Kant, proposes a new type of man. Man as intellect. Man is above all as a rational being. Everything else in him is unimportant to the extent that reason is able to claim primacy in his being. Yet the volitionists, who are led by Schopenhauer and Steinmeier, protest that the most important element in man has been omitted. Man's essence cannot be summed up in the senses nor in his reason, since he is neither one of these, Rather, he is foremost comprised of volition. Indeed, they say man as volition is the true man. It's a free will, I guess. He is the new man. So, um, so the first thing about the senses, man as senses. The moment you say man, if you define man as the senses, you basically turn him into an animal. You basically say you are an animal. Only the most ba debased animals can be said to be guided by, defined by their senses. Um, and this whole, this whole page, the, these whole pages are gold mines. Uh, one of the things he says, yeah, he, he says the superhuman of Nietzsche is a subhuman. He says the superhuman of Nietzsche is a subhuman because the superhuman is without God. The European man is without God. He has degenerated on account of the, his humanistic education has become a base and significant, insignificant man. There is more that I, that I could talk about, but I'll, I just want to show you the pages. If you're listening to this on your car ride, then, then here's what I will tell you that you can do. Um, you can just read the book for yourself. And I will advise you to read the book. It's a good book. It's a good book. I had fun reading it. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of wisdom. So I want to read the quote and then move on to the next section. Since he has killed God, both God and the soul from within, the European type of man has already gradually become, has gradually been committing suicide for some decades. So the European man, the atheistic man is committing suicide. Suicide is the inevitable outcome of murdering God. Education without God has led Europe and the whole world into a darkness such as humanity has never seen. In this darkness, no one knows anyone and no one recognizes anyone as his brother. If you're, if you're atheist or secular or whatever, read, under, implant this quote in your mind. Just, just implant this quote in your mind and think about it. And look at the universities, the high schools and whatever. And tell me this. With all your heart, is he not 100% correct? Is he not 100% correct? If you say, no, he's wrong, he's lying, it's, you're kidding yourself. You're lying. You're not lying to me. You're, you're lying to yourself. Just look at education today. I don't even need to tell you anything more than that. Just look at it today. That's all you do. It's full of jesters, full of clowns, full of disgraceful people. But I will move on from that. Um, having commented on education, St. Justin Popovich says, all right, what, what is, how should we do divine education? The main guidelines and characteristics of divine education can be formulated as follows. 
Man is a being who can be perfected and completed in the most ideal and real way by the God-man and in the God-man. This is to say in the Christ. The perfection of man by the God-man takes place with the help of the evangelical witnesses. So the evangelical witnesses of the saints, of the prophets, of the scriptures. The illuminated and educated man sees in every man his immortal and eternal brother. So the, the educated man loves all man, even the most disgusting man. Every human work in action, philosophy, science, geography, art, education, culture, manual labor receives its eternal value. So it does indeed have value, but, the, but it gets its value from the God-man, from Christ. True enlightenment and education is accomplished through a holy life according to the gospel of Christ. So imitating the gospel, imitating Christ is true enlightenment and education. The saints are the most perfect illuminators and educators. The more holy a man is, the better and educated illuminator he becomes. So if you're a worldly trash bag, then you can't really teach people. You're a bad teacher. Uh, school is the second half of the heart of the God-man. The first is the church. And finally, at the center of all centers and of all his ideas and labors stands the God-man Christ in his theanthropic society. That is the church. So, another opportunity for you to review what we talked about. This is mainly concerning education because we are, again, we're going to be changing the topic so give me a give me a small little breather and I'll be kicking hard. All right, we are ready once more. Let me get to the part. Okay, man, it's been 46 minutes and I haven't even gone through 20% of my notes. Uh, maybe I'll have to split this video. Or maybe this will just be a very like incredibly long video. Who knows? Because I don't. Only God knows. All right, it's very really hot in here. Huh? What's the? Let me let me look at how hot it is in here. All right, it's it's 29 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that means in Fahrenheit, but I think that means 85 or something like that, 85 or 90. And the humidity is like 50%. I don't know what that means because I don't know what humidity does. All I know is that it's very hot in here. Um, and you'd think summer is over, but no. It's actually real summer has begun, has just begun. But... Who cares? We're talking about other stuff. Oh, man. Can you hear that? You can. Well, we're going to have to deal with that. I'm sorry, but... Uh, or RV. Yeah, we are going to have to deal with that. It's just background. So it's not a big... It's not a mega big deal. So... St. Justin talks about reality. And he says that reality is... That is... Let me, hold up, let me get my phone. Reality, which is material, is apprehended by the intellect, which is immaterial. So, all realities function according to an immaterial intellect, therefore. And so it's kind of basically saying, for material reality to be true, there needs to be a divine immaterial mind to connect the materia with the immaterial. Man lays the foundation for his visible life, for his life in time and space, on the invisible that is on the soul, on its thoughts, and on its conscience. The human mind, therefore, wants to apprehend infinite immaterial realities, because that is by nature what it desires to do. Therefore, this is why man desires theosis at the end of the day. This is why they desire deification. But this desire is not 
true it's not merely human <coughs> it's not some it's not a material impulse it's an immaterial mi impulse a gift from god in our human nature which is why different philosophical systems at the end of the day different philosophical systems try to achieve this reality Bearing this in mind, the fall of man becomes a fall from God towards self-autonomy. The fall is less of a God expelling Adam and more of an Adam expelling God. And thus man becomes a Nietzschean superhuman, which is in its essence a subhuman. Yeah, I, I hope it's not really loud because it is loud in here. Um, which is why Adam... Which is why the fall, like the fall, Adam being expelled was kind of necessary because if Adam remained in the garden, he will probably have burned from expelling God. So it's kind of, it's, it's a mercy thing. And I think St. Kirill of Alexandria also says the same thing in Genesis. He basically makes the same argument that actually it is God, that them getting out of the garden is, is an act of God's mercy, not of God's justice. So it's not actually... So in a sense, what will be just will be to let Adam stay. But the merciful thing will be to kick Adam out. The philosophy of humanism is fundamentally anti-God because it is the never-ending decision of eating the apple in the garden, which is expelling God from us, making man his own God. Man in turns from divine human becomes merely human, because he rejects the divine gifts implanted in him by becoming self-autonomous. Oh, man. Um, all right. You're going you're gonna to have to bear with me here. I, I lost some of my notes. I don't know what happened, but... Um Thus, Christ's incarnation becomes necessary to restore the divine human being of man. Uh, St. Justin says, perfect divine wisdom, perfect divine wisdom, logic, and intelli intelligence has entered into human nature through the incarnation of the divine Logos. Man tries to find the truth. Hold up. Can you give me a second? Can you give me a second? All right, notice how there's no sound because I closed every single door of my house. So I'm going to probably, I'm going to probably rot <laughs> from the heat, but that's fine. Um, but I, I will, to get back on pop topic, St. Justin says, perfect divine wisdom, logic, intelligence has entered into human nature through the incarnation of the divine logos. Um, man tries to find the truth, but because of his atheistic humanistic methods, he fails to attain truth. And in order, to, and I would like to add that that is why fate is an integral part of it. Fate is not something that is contrary to reason. Fate is what completes reason in understanding God. And when you have atheistic humanistic methods, you cannot, not only can you understand God, but it's even more beyond that. And that's what we see in all atheistic philosophies is that they fail to understand even themselves, even the nature of their own world. Look at the atheistic presuppositions, the atheistic worldview, and tell me I'm wrong. Can they understand the nature of ethics and morals? Give me a break. They don't even believe in immaterial things because the moment they have to accept them, by the way, the moment they have to accept them, what are they going to do? Oh, they're going to have to ask themselves, okay, what connects the immaterial things with the material reality, right? But... So I'm talking more about the materialist atheist, which is the most, which is the more common atheistic um, understanding of how the world works. So you can't understand that. You can't understand 
the meaning of life. Why are you why are you doing this? Why are you doing what you are doing? To feel happy? Is that is that what you're doing? Do you want to you want to feel happy? You want to feel you want to feel some dopamine in your brain? You want to you want your brain to tell you you enjoy life? How do you know that's real because you feel it? Of course, you can, they can answer the, these questions because they can't know. And the funny, the funniest thing is that if you analyze the atheistic worldview in more detail, you'll realize they have more faith. They use, they utilize more faith than we do sometimes. Uh, just, oh, you know, I just believe logic exists. Right? You, this is what Matt Dillahunty did in his debate with Jay Dyer. Logic just is, or like the 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 Tom Junk idiot who said reality is reality. It's, it just is. Just trust me. Just trust. Reality is just reality. It's just trust our senses, man. How is that not having more faith? The problem is you might have more faith, but you don't have faith in God. You have faith in yourself. That is a wrong place to place your faith in understanding the world. That is the wrong place to place faith. So to understand the manifestation of truth in the person of Christ, one has to grow out of the atheistic secular paradigm approach of truth. So we cannot use atheistic argumentation. So we cannot say that, oh, you know, let's say origin is not condemned because it was a later addition in the Anatomas. And the 6th and the 7th Ecumenical Councils were wrong in thinking they were additions. That is an atheistic argumentation. That is an atheistic secular paradigm approach of truth because that is when you say, I know more than the ch church which I am supposed to believe is the theanthropic body of Christ. The church made a mistake and I know the truth. That is an atheistic argumentation. People that make those arguments, they can, they can say, I believe in God all they want. At the end of the day, they are no different than the lowest atheist. And just write, write this somewhere, write this somewhere in your head, because that is the truth. You will realize eventually, if you haven't already, those kinds of people are lower than the lowest kinds of atheists. So, to change the topic from how stupid atheists are, let's go to recapitulation. God will restore and recapitulate all things. And one of the reasons that God will restore all creation is because creation fell into sin and is corrupted. And so there is a divine mission now to fulfill that, to, to bring reality back to what it's supposed to be. Christ as a divine human person is the most valuable of all beings and as such he is the same time the highest cr criterion of all true values. So any values outside of Christ, they don't matter. They're, they're, they're who cares, right? They're who cares? It's only Christ that matters. In this sense, in this world, any being inferior to the God-man cannot become the criterion of all value, values because that which is of the greatest value is none other than the person of the God-man himself. Man cannot be the criterion. But hey, f realize how this is all personal and not impersonal. Man cannot be the criterion since his value is much less than that of the God-man. The God-man constitutes the highest criterion of anything, divine or human, both in this world and the next, simply because he is the most valuable of all beings. <clears throat> and truth is the theanthropic personhood of Christ. It is not a merely philosophical, immaterial concept. It is a real being, a real active agent, a real active subject, a real active person. Truth is personal. Truth is Christ. And the church is the church only through the God-man and, and in the God-man. The New Testament can be summed up in one comprehensive truth. The God-man is the essence, the purpose, the meaning, and the essential value of the church. He is its soul. He is its heart, and He is its life. He is the church in its entirety and tropic fullness. The church is nothing other than the God-man. Christ projected through all the centuries. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Matthew 28, 20. And St. Paul quotes this in his first epistle to Ephesians. 
So to recap, God is not an abstract category. God is a historical person. This is what separates us from paganism. Paganism considers God as this merely abstract category, whereas in Christianity, he is a person. He is a real person. Our personhood in its foundation is from divine personhood in the Trinity. And he reveals himself in history. This is why, by the way, hyper-allegorism that some people engage in scripture, like Neo-Marcionites do regularly, is heretical and it's pagan in its origin. Because what happened in the Bible, in Genesis, it's historical. It's not a myth, but it's historical. It's something that really happened in history. It's real history. It's just as real as Alexander the Great telling his officers to race mix with the Persians. It's just as real history as that. It's just as real history as, I don't know, Greeks being sodomites. I don't, <laughs> it's, if that's real history, that's real history. This is also real history. It's just as real history as Ottomans conquering the Byzantine Empire in 1453. It's just as real history as... You get the point. You get the point. If that is history, this is history. They're both part of history. So one of them is not a merely, purely allegorical thing that, uh, that didn't really happen in history, but it's just written by people who are new agey idiots. No, this is paganism. This is pagan in its origin. Mythology is paganism. Mythology does not exist in Christianity. In so far as you mean myth by myth, do you, if you mean story, if you mean narrative, then yes, there is mythology. In terms of narrative, there is narrative. But narrative can be historical and real, obviously. So let's move on to our best friends, Roman Catholicism. St. Justin has a lot to say about Roman Catholicism. And I will tell you this, if you think I'm too harsh to Roman Catholics, St. Justin is way harsher to you than I, I, I can ever be. So, um, St. Justin says on Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, he says, In the European West, Christianity gradually became transformed into humanism. For several centuries, the God-man became more and more limited and confined to his humanity eventually becoming the infallible man of Rome and of Berlin. Thus, on the one hand, there appeared a Western Christian humanistic maximalism, which is the papacy, which took everything away from Christ, and on the other hand, a Western Christian humanistic minimalism, which is Protestantism, which sought very little, if anything, from Christ. In both, man takes the place of the God-man as, as that which is of most value, and is the measure of all things. Thus, a most grievous correction of the God-man, his work and his teaching was accomplished. The papacy persistently and continuously tried to replace the God-man with man, until finally, when the dogma of the infallibility of man supplanted the God-man with an infallible man, with this dogma man, the Pope was proclaimed decisively and clearly to be something not only greater than man, but greater than the holy apostles, the holy fathers, and the ecumenical synods. I also want to say it's, it's, it's kind of ironic that you have like a lot of allegoristic guys. By the way, al allegory is not evil in, in itself, by the way, but like people that like prioritize allegory and make it everything, makes, make, make that basically the whole point of scripture. Isn't it interesting that, oops, isn't it interesting that they don't trust the Holy Spirit and his inerrancy, but they trust that a mere man can be infallible in his declarations when he feels like it. Is it? Think, think about that for a second. The Holy Spirit was unclear when it determined whether the Old Testament is true or not, whether it's all an allegory or not. But the Pope is clear. So the Pope is clearer than God. Just think about it. Um, this whole page 
I will not be reading because it's too long. But I, I, I think, I, I, as far as I remember, some of the main points is that Roman Catholicism de-incarnates Christ as one of the arguments that he makes. Um, Roman Catholicism, oh, he says, he, he argues that Western Christian humanistic maximalism, i.e. the papacy, is fundamentally Protestantism. Since So the original Protestantism is, the pap is Roman Catholicism, says St. Justin. It removed the foundation of Christianity from the eternal God-man and placed it in finite man, claiming this to be the measuring criterion of all. Protestantism did nothing more than to simply accept this dogma and to develop it to a point where it has reached horrendous proportions and particulars. And so Protestantism, he says, is just logical conclusion of the papacy. And I think... Um, one of the other arguments is that Christ was replaced by the, the Pope in this view. And he, moves on, and he also makes the argument that Roman Catholicism is the birth child of atheistic secular humanism. So if you have a problem with secular humanism of the modern day, it's atheism, then look no further than Roman Catholicism, says St. Justin Popovich. So this isn't even some random idiot on Twitter saying this. This is a saint in, or in Orthodox Church making these critiques. All I'm doing is I'm just repeating what he says. People are considering replacing humanistic Christianity with ancient polytheistic religion. The voice of some people in the Protestant world crying, Zuruksu Jesus, back to Jesus, constitute V Christ in the moonless night of humanistic Christianity it is this Christianity who tells you to go back to Jesus that abandoned Christianity in the first place. And he cites Prophet Jeremiah who says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. That means who trusts in man who is not the God-man. In broad historical perspective, Western dogma concerning the infallibility of humanity is nothing other than an effort to revitalize and perpetuate a dying European humanism. This is the last transformation and final glorification of humanism. After the rationalistic enlightenment of the 18th century and the myopic positivism of the 19th, nothing else remains within European humanism except for its decomposition into contradiction and passivity. And all of these things that he's talking about, he is talking about Roman Catholicism as the causation of all this. At this tragic moment, religious humanism appeared with the dogma of the infallibility of man and saved European humanism from imminent death. Yet even with its extreme dogmatic tendencies, Western humanism, Western Christian humanism, could not contain within itself all the deadly contradictions of European humanism, which converge in one wish that the God-man is removed from earth to heaven. This is so since the fundamental tenets of humanism is that man is to become the most malleable being and the measure of all things. What do the Roman Catholics say all the time? Oh, uh, you need a Pope figure. You need a Pope figure, man. So they cast out Christ and replace him with the Pope. And, some, and they will say, ah, oh, but he's a mediator. He's a mediator. In reality, that is not how it works. All the European humanisms, from the most primitive to the most sophisticated, from the fetishistic to the papal, are based on a belief in man as he finds himself in the midst of his given spiritual and physical empirical situation and historical context. In this view, the essence of, human, essence of every humanism is man, and encapsulated in the ontology of every humanism is nothing other than humanism. Man is the highest value, the supreme value. And... And what is talk, what is getting at is that humanism is closely tied with the papacy. It is tied with Nietzschean assertion of superhuman. And Saint Justin says, "The dogma concerning the infallibility of the 20th century Pope is nothing other than the rebirth of idolatry and polytheism." The rebirth of idolatrous value judgments and criteria. But, but this also has to be said. The dogma concerning the infallibility of the Pope was introduced in the dogma of idolatrous humanism, which in the first instance was Hellenic humanism. And 
you can read the rest of the page if you want to. want to i'm not gonna stick more on it and what in reality happened says saint justin what in reality happened is that it made the devil the god of this age and it's changed man changed its king from christ to himself and so papal infallibility in some sense is like the fall from the garden of eden in some sense in the, in this regard papal infallibility that is as what saint justin says through the dogma of of infallibility the pope usurped for himself that is for man the entire jurisdiction and all the prerogatives which belong only to the lord god man so only god only christ has the power has that power that the pope is trying to usurp for himself and do you know what is the funniest part the funniest part of all this saint justin asked for forgiveness because he cited the second vatican council so for him, the Second Vatican Council is so disgusting. It's, it's so disgusting for him that he doesn't even want to utter it. And yet somehow we're the same church, by the way. <laughs> St. Justin goes on to say, I'm reading a quote from him. However, the dogma of papal infallibility is not only a heresy, but the greatest heresy against the true church of, true church of Christ which has existed in our terrestrial world as a theanthropic body ever since the appearance of the God-man. No other heresy has revolted so violently and so completely against the God-man Christ and his church, as has the papacy with the dogma of the Pope-man's infallibility. There is no doubt about it. This dogma is the heresy of heresies, a revolt without precedent against the God-man Christ on this earth, a new betrayal of Christ, a new crucifixion of the Lord, this time not on wood, but on the golden cross of papal humanism. And these things are hell, damnation for the wretched earthly being called man. All men in the presence of Christ will naturally feel... Uh, oh, this is not continuous. I, I was, my notes were a bit silly, but... All men in the presence of Christ will naturally feel sinful. St. Justin published the example of St. John of Damascus and St. Simeon, the new theologian. In spite of their divine piety, they were humble enough to claim that they were the worst sinners in the presence of Christ. However, in the humanism of the papacy, pride becomes the key rather than humility. Humanism is prideful because it puts faith in not in God but in rationalism. Remember, in the Council of Florence, when the when the pre, when the bishop when the Greek bishops came to the Pope, they 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 greeted him as a fellow brother, and what did the Pope reply to them? I'm not lying. Check, check the Council of Florence. It's all out there. You can easily find it. What did the Pope say? Brothers, go kiss my feet. That's what he told them. Go kiss my feet. That's, what you, that's where you belong, he said. You belong there, not here. You're not my brother. You're my underling. Now, the irony here is that 500 years later, it's Pope Francis that's kissing people's feet now. Feet now. I mean, divine, <laughs> divine providence is so beautiful sometimes. It is so beautiful. The way some institutions can get humbled, the way they get humbled, is really otherworldly. And um, I'm going to give me a single minute. Think about all it. Review all of this while I'm gone. I'll be back in a minute. Review all of this while I'm gone. Think about, reflect on this stuff. Or if you want to read more, just skip a couple of seconds ahead and you'll hear me talking for more. So, but I'll, I'll take a little break. Uh, I'll be right back.
I am black. That means I'm back. And are we done with our break? Did we, did we take our did we take our toilet break, everyone? You feeling good? You feeling you feeling bright? Still can't believe that I'm banned on Twitter. Um, it's not the end of the world, but I am kind of mad because I did I did have a lot of followers, and I got suspended for a very stupid reason. At least if it was for a good reason. Could have been cool, but it's not for a good reason. Um, we are moving on with the next topic. This is going to be, I think, a more more of a... <laughs> thank you, Spike. Ad what was his name? Adam something. Very cool. I shall, I shall mute my phone. Um, we are moving on to the theory of knowledge according to St. Isaac the Syrian. <coughs> This article, this is going to be a summary of that article. It's from the same book. And this is going to be heavily ascetical. So I'm going to kind of, I'm going to refrain from making comments because I don't think I'm, I deserve to even make comments. But I'm, ju I'm just going to kind of read quotes. And give you some... <coughs> <coughs> I'm sweating so hard right now. 30 degrees Celsius, 6 p.m. Life is harsh sometimes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is not harsh at all. It's just annoying. Um, <clears throat> so let's start by talking about some of the terms that we're going to be using. Passions. Passions are the unnatural illnesses of the soul. They are not our soul nor a faculty of our soul. They are corruption that inhibit in our soul. And it, it corrupts our perception of reality. Passions can be categorized as hardness or insensitivity of being. Their causes are of worldly things. Passions are the desire for wealth and amassing goods for self-comfort. These are examples. They are the thirst for worldly honor among men. They are the exercise of power over among others. Thus, we call passions the world. And this is why we say death to the world. Because death to the world is death to the passions. And the world constantly attacks us. Passions attack us and try to drive us away from God. The only defense against the world is God's divine grace. St. Justin Popovich says they confuse the mind, filling it with fantastic forms and images and desires that his thoughts are disturbed and filled with fantasy. St. Isaac the Syria, Syrian says the world is a prostitute, so our passions are prostitutes. The healing of the soul can only be achieved through the purification of passions, and to do so, we must attain virtue. So in order to protect, so in order to attain grace, we must attain virtue and cleanse our soul from passions with virtue. Every virtue is a cross for us to bear. So instead of hating the life that is given to us by God, we must, like St. Isaac the Syrian, love the hardships that are given to us because it is an opportunity to cultivate us into greater beings. To free, free us from material passions, attaining true freedom and true likeness of God in the in process. So in order to heal our souls, we must separate good from evil and resist evil to attain the virtues and start the process of healing. So let's talk about the virtues. Faith is the most important and powerful virtue. It gives up worldly powers in substitute for the divine power of God. The soul thus moves from being empirical to spiritual and senses the world in its true mode that the empirical mode cannot comprehend. Real intellectualism is of the faithful mind since it unlocks its true potential. St. Justin and St. Isaac associate gluttony with faithlessness since gluttony clouds the mind and makes it satisfied due to earthly attainment, which is why fasting is crucial. By the way, I'm not going to make much comment, but this is something I want to make a lot of comments on because... And this is, this is David, the real call-out man. This is the real call-out man. I look at certain apologists. I look at their bodies. And we, God gave us eyes and God gave us a brain. And God gave us the understanding that if someone is fat... There are most likely, there might be some exceptions, 
maybe they had to eat because of some sickness or maybe because of other circumstances. Maybe it's because they didn't eat as much, but that's just what their body did. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Very low chance, but maybe. But although not all gluttonous people are fat, it is a good idea to understand that most fat people are gluttonous, right? And you might say, well, but we have fat priests, we have fat monks. And a lot of people might criticize me for saying this, but that just means they're gluttonous. I mean, monks, priests, they're not perfect. I'm sorry, but they're not perfect. And um, if you weigh a ton, if, you, if, you as, if you're as heavy as a car, then you're gluttonous. I'm sorry, but you're probably gluttonous. 90% you're gluttonous. Where am I getting this? Where, where am I going with this? What does St. Isaac, St. John, Damascus, St. Justin, what do they say? They say, gluttony clouds the mind. It's in, it's in the book. Uh, let me, let me, sh get this, it, it's not in this page, but <clears throat> maybe in a future page. Uh, let me make sure. No. But, <clears throat> But what I, what I was getting at, the gluttony clouds your mind. It, it inhibits, it, it pulls your mind back from what it can do. Why am I talking about this? There are certain apologists. I will not name them, but there, some of them are called Eric Yabara, who are fat. They're gluttonous. And they're apologists. Now, what do you need when you're doing apology? You need intellect. Intellect. You need to be smart. You need to be intelligent. And your intellect should not be clouded by passions. Because if it's clouded, then that put, puts it back. In short, I'll say it like this. If you are gluttonous, and this is not just me saying this. It's just me saying it in a obvi more obvious, effective way. So that some people can understand. If you're gluttonous, and this goes to people, maybe there are gluttonous people that are watching this, and this will give them more motivation to not be gluttonous, to try to get themselves away from this sin, to start fasting. If you're gluttonous, you are an idiot. You are stupid. You are low IQ. That's what you are. I'm sorry, but you're stupid. And if your name is, and if you're an apologist, whose name I will not mention, like Eric Ibarra. And you try to, you should not do apology by the sole fact you're fat. And so, actually, in the context of Christianity, you are fat is a great argument. <laughs> Your gluttonous is a great argument because that means they're stupid. If they're stupid, they're probably not going to make good arguments. And again, this is my call out mode. Um, I know I've been, I've been, uh, I know it's very harsh, but some people need to hear this. If you're a fan of mine and you're fat and you're gluttonous, use this as a motivation. Look, there's a Turkish saying. I'm not going to translate it fully well because it's kind of difficult, but it, it goes something like a true friend speaks hurtful things. And the idea behind it is that a true friend is willing to hurt you to really help help you. That's the meaning behind it. If you're hurt by it, I don't really care. What I do really care about is that if you can actually purify yourself of that sin. So use that as a motivation. Let this video change your life. <laughs> and this is, by the way, I don't like G.K. Chesterton because he's fat. He's, he's obese. Why will I listen to an obese man? Why will I listen to an obese man? Obese people are idiots. They're stupid people. Look at obese people on television. You think they're geniuses? Every single obese people I saw in my life were idiots. I had a German teacher. He was obese. He was a retard. He was an idiot. He was low IQ. And he, like, 
he looked like a globe. <laughs> he looked like a gigantic globe. And then, oh, you're fat shaming. Yeah, I am fat shaming because I don't want you to be fat. You should stop being fat. Fat people are idiots. Stop being fat and you'll stop being an idiot. Simple as that. Fast. Fast more. Again, some people need to hear this. Some people really need to hear this. But... Right, gluttony. I, I talked about gluttony. Uh, to get back on faith. Faith is attained by reading scriptures, lives of the saints, and constant remembrance of God. If faith had a language, it will be named prayer, says St. Justin. Great statement. Man crucifies himself in prayer, and prayer itself is a struggle. And so that is why if you have a hard time praying... I should definitely listen to this. If you have a hard time praying, then that means you're struggling. That's good. Good. If you're praying and you're, you're, you're like, I don't want to pray. I've had enough of this. Good. That's, that's great. That's amazing. That means you're making progress. Pray more. Pray more. If you think prayer is supposed to feel good, like, oh, you know, my dopamine's going wild. Free Wi-Fi really make me go wild. And if, that, if that's your mindset when you're trying to pray, you're making zero progress. You're making zero, absolutely zero progress. You're supposed to have a lot of difficulty when you're praying. Let's talk about love. What is love? Baby, baby, don't hurt me. No more. Sorry, I am baby and I will hurt you a lot more. True love is impossible without faith and prayer because they are prerequisites. So in order to have love, you need to have faith and you need to have prayer. St. Isaac is the per Saint Isaac's perfect example of love is the quote from Abba Agaton. The perfect example of love is to find a leper and to change bodies with him. To give your body to him and to take his body from him. This is exactly what Christ does. He finds the leper, which is us, and changes body with, with him, meaning becomes incarnate, and suffers as the leper for the benefit of purifying us. This is what Christ does for us. And this is the example of true love. St. Isaac the Syrian says, Paradise is the love of God in which lies the sweetness of all blessings. Hell is the absence of this, but also it is the absence, but also the whiplash of the presence of God, God's love simultaneously. Because the absence of love is not the absence of God's love. It's the absence of your love to God. And that's why you're feeling the whiplash. He then more on says, First acquire love, which is the original form of man's contemplation of the Holy Trinity. Thus, Love is absolutely contradictory to humanism. Say St. Justin. Humility. Faith presents the new way of thinking, and this is humility. Humility caused the Son of God to become man and suffer for us on the cross. So yeah, I've talked about this a couple of, uh, an, hour before, an hour ago. St. Isaac says, Humility made God a man on earth. And by the way, humility made God a man on earth? Hey, Taylor Marshall, who you're also probably gluttonous and stupid. I thought St. Isaac was an historian. I thought he was an historian, bro. But here he says, humility made God a man on earth. I thought he was an historian, bro. I thought you knew better than we did. <laughs> but no, Taylor Marshall... Taylor, Taylor Milker Marshall, if you have seen the, the stupid vision that he got, he got a vision in his dream of a, of a big titty woman who is protruding milk from her nipples. And he's like, this is the church. No, dude, you're just a pervert. That's what you are. You're a pervert. And you got a perverse dream. If that was going to be the message, it will not be a blonde Blonde woman with big boobs who is poisoned. That's not, it will be explained a better way, not with that. When turned towards the world, a humble man reveals the whole of his personality through humility, who imitates 
imitating in this God incarnate. Just as the soul is unknown and invisible to bodily sight, so a humble man is unknown among men. So all your good deeds is unknown among men. And this is what's so difficult about humility, is that this is why I don't like people saying, I'll pray for you in public. In private, you can say that for assurance. I'm, I don't mind that, but like, like when you're on Twitter, which I am banned from, oh, but if, if you're on Twitter, for example, and you like some guy is like, oh, I feel bad and blah, blah, or like you're like, you're like, I'll pray for you. Or like, here's a very bad example of this very, very disgusting, animalistic example of this pharisaical example of this, where if you're fighting with someone and the guy ends with, oh, I'll pray for you, but oh, I'll pray for you in a passive aggressive way. That guy is lower than the Pharisee. He is a lower, he's lower than the Pharisee. Simple as that. I don't like that. I don't like that kind of stuff. I don't like the I'll pray for you language in public. I, it really bothers me because I don't think it's humble. Yeah, I think it goes contrary to humility. We should really genuinely, if you're going to be doing good things, no one, no one, people, it seems strange to say, but true humility is letting people know the bad things of you and hiding the good things from you. That doesn't mean that like, we act like dicks to people and then like in private, we like, I don't know, act nice. Like, that's, that's, that's deception. That's deception. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about, you know, almsgiving, right? No one should know how much money you gave to the church. No one. If someone asks you, did you give alms? You should say, I don't know. Just say, I don't know. Um, maybe even just say, no, I didn't. And, um, I'll just say, I, I don't know, but this is, this is very important. I feel a lot of people miss out on this. I, I genuinely do not understand. Maybe, maybe I am missing something. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm the stupid one, but it, it boggles my mind. So the basic on grace and freedom, he says, the basic indication of Christian activity is man working with God and God working with man. This is completely contradictory with monergism. Completely contradictory. You cannot be a monergist. If you want to be a Christian even. Because the basic indication of Christian activity is man working with God. If man does not work with God, then what's the point of man? What's the point of all this? The man is not created in the image of God as well. Um... So there is also this page that I want to show you on uh, on the importance of divine grace. This is, by the way, uncreated grace. This is not some created grace polytheism nonsense. This is uncreated grace that St. Justin and St. Isaac talk about. On the topic of purification of the intellect, the intellect as the soul cleanses itself from passion also becomes purified. St. Isaac connects gluttony with the intellect, being hindered with impurity and heaviness, which means fasting purifies the intellect. We need to remember the intellect by nature is clean and good. It is only corrupted with evil and sin as an accident. Hence, why we fast to purify our intellect and to bring it back to what it's supposed to be. Once the intellect is purified, it can see the mysteries of God much more cleanly. Only the mind that has been cleansed by grace can offer spiritual knowledge. Until the mind goes through this process, it cannot receive spiritual knowledge. Therefore, the virtues are the wings of the intellect, which raises it to heaven. And the purposes of all of the commandments of God is not for it to be law unto itself, but it is to purify the heart and raise or raise or intellect, raise or being into heaven. Um... He says, St. Isaac writes, in what, does, in what sense does purity of intellect differ from purity of heart? Purity of intellect is one thing, but purity of heart is another. For the intellect is one of the senses of the soul, but the heart contains the interior senses and governs them. It is their root. And if the root is holy, then the branches are also holy, says St. Isaac. And how does it acquire purity? By many trials tribulations and tears and by the mortifying of all that is of the world 
Saint Isaac says, how do we know that we have become purified? He replies, when he sees all men as good and no one appears to him to be unclean or profane. So if you look at someone and you see this guy is a piece of shit, then you have not achieved purity of heart nor intellect. And um, St. Isaac also talks about knowledge. There are two types of faith and two types of knowledge. Says Saint Isaac, uh, the first comes true. The, the two types of faith: the first is true hearing and is also confirmed and proven by the second, the faith of contemplation, the faith that is based on what has been seen. In order to acquire spiritual knowledge, a man must be first freed from natural knowledge. This is the work of faith. Uh, natural knowledge presupposes unfaith which is why we cannot derive our faith from natural knowledge, but must truly repent and acquire faith. Natural knowledge does not exist for faith, but it can be a force of good because natural knowledge, according to St. Isaac, is not at fault, even though he criticizes it. He says it's not a fault. It is not to be rejected. It is just that faith is higher than it. And when it's united with faith, natural knowledge, natural knowledge, what does natural knowledge mean? N knowledge of the world. So geography, uh, sports, right? That's natural knowledge. It is good if you combine it with faith. And there are multiple layers of knowledge that we're going to be talking about. So the lowest level of knowledge is worldly knowledge puffed up with pride and is inherently worldly. Thus, this knowledge consists of knowledge of the arts, worldly philosophy, as opposed to the divine philosophy, and even science. So... Being better at science does not mean that you have more knowledge. It translates, it means that you have more lower kind of knowledge. Thus, this kind of knowledge, when left unchecked, opposes faith and reason that follows faith. The one tick upper will be the knowledge is the practice of virtues. This knowledge is given to you in the form of divine grace by the Holy Spirit. The third degree of knowledge is perfection. St. Isaac the Syrian says, when knowledge rises up above the earth and the care for earthly things and begins to examine its own interior and hidden thoughts, scorning that from which the evil of the passions spring and rising up to follow the way of faith and concern for the life to come and in the seeking of out of hidden mysteries, then faith takes this knowledge into itself and absorbs it, returning and giving birth to it from the beginning so as to begin itself from the beginning so as to become itself Holy Spirit. Uh, hold up. Just kill the fly. St. Justin Pavish says, The first degree of knowledge cools the soul's ardor for endeavors on God's path. The second rekindles it for the swift path that leads to faith. The third is a rest from toil when the mind feasts on the mysteries of the life to come. But as nature cannot as yet wholly rise to the level of deathlessness and overcome the weight of the flesh and perfect itself in spiritual knowledge, not even this third degree of knowledge is able to move towards total perfection so as to live in the world of death and yet leave behind completely fleshed in nature. St. Isaac is asked, what is knowledge? He answers the perception of eternal life. The question then becomes, what is eternal life? The answer is to perceive all things in God for love comes through understanding and the knowledge of God is ruler over all desires. To the heart that receives this knowledge Every delight that exists on earth is superfluous, for there is nothing that can compare with the delight of the knowledge of God. St. Isaac is then asked, what is truth? St. Isaac answers, truth is the perception of things that is given by God. In other words, the, percep the perception of God is truth. If this perception exists in a man, he both has and knows the truth. If he does not have this perception, then truth does not exist for him. Such a man may always be seeking truth, but he will never find it until it comes to the perception of God in which lie both the perception and knowledge of truth. Both St. Justin and St. Isaac says, Holy knowledge comes from a holy life, but pride darkens that holy knowledge. The crucifixion of the intellect means that we don't abandon the intellect, but we purify it from worldly and atheistic passions and corruptions. For St. Isaac, the Syrian knowledge is about man's ethical and religious state. He says the more perfect a man is from the religious and moral standpoint, the more perfect is his knowledge. 
Virtues, I'm still reading my notes here, this is not a quote, but it's in notes. Virtues are not merely powers of knowledge, they are the source of knowledge itself. Orthodox philosophy is the ascetical cleansing of the intellect and the whole person. And in contrast, naive realism is completely unattainable. And, um, because it abandons the true organ of knowledge with the, with the corrupted worldly mind. The worldly mind <coughs> can attain knowledge, but not in its passionate form, not in its corrupted form. Um, And we're reaching the end. This is going to take less than two hours, which is kind of surprising. But this, I'm going to be talking about some of the select writings of St. Justin. So these are, again, more quotations, more notes. The select writings of St. Justin are below. St. Justin says, Sin is the only natural thing in man and the world. St. John Chrysostom says, Satan is sin. As long as, and, and, and I noted here, as long as, man is, as long as man is unrepentant, he will be in the snares of Satan. So he will basically be captured by satan true sin man opposes god he becomes god fighting in opposition to god sin is the main energy of the devil because he can bear neither god nor anything divine when he is firmly established in the soul of man he gradually destroys all goodness within him first faith then prayer then love fasting almsgiving with the desire to sin man is gradually planning his suicide there is no worse form of homicide than that which occurs through sin it is truly the murder of man Therefore, the main task of the spiritually vigilant man is to kill the sin within himself and in this way, kill the devil himself, which assassinates us through sin. But how can man kill sin? How will man kill Satan? This can only be done through the God-man Jesus Christ who became man for this purpose only. He accomplishes this through our faith in him or love for him or repentance before him or prayer for him. So atheist people, even good-minded atheists, they are being corrupted they are decaying they are dying time over time because they do not accept christ the prodigal son parable illustrates how man created in divine kingly image loses it when he runs away from god and as sin corrupts him man loses the divine likeness only by repentance can man face can man turn away from sin and back to god St. Justin says the sacred dogmas are the eternal and saving divine truths. So Christology, Tridology, all that stuff that I'm talking about, they're, I'm talking about eternal saving divine truths when I'm talking about this. So it's not just pure intellectual masturbation, but they are very important for us. They're based upon the life-giving power of the divine Holy Trinity from which all of the power of the new life in Christ is derived. The new life in Christ is viewed completely from the dogmas, from the dogmatic truths of the revelation of God. St. Justin speaks of philosophy, and he says, The philosophy of the Holy Spirit is the wisdom and the knowledge, the wisdom through grace and knowledge by the grace of the nature of beings. And this wisdom possesses as the pupil of the eye the knowledge of the divine and the human, the visible and the invisible, the philosophy of the Holy Spirit is at the same time the creative power which by becoming similar with God through the road of the ascetical charismatic perfection multiplies within man the divine wisdom, orthodox, divine wisdom about God, the world, and man. This character of the orthodox philosophy emphasizes St. John Damascus when he says philosophy is to liken with God and therefore is the art of arts and the science of sciences. So essentially divine philosophy, orthodox philosophy, is good. It's not evil. It's good. It's, it's what we should be doing. As a source of life, the philosophy of the Holy Spirit to the only, is the only art which has the manifold possibilities to fabricate a God-like and Christ-like personality and is the only science which can teach the selfish and mortal man how to overcome death and obtain immortality. Therefore, the Orthodox philosophy is the art of arts and the science of sciences. Another select saying of St. Justin, man has the potential to be of the devil and to be of the God at the same time. It all depends on what man does. So there are no monergism, there is synergism. 
God according to the paradise, the feeling of God according to the word of the Holy Fathers. If you feel God within yourself, then you have already reached paradise. The saint of our time, Saint John of Cross, that says, when God is present in all of man's thoughts, in all of his desires, and in all of his intentions, through his words and through his acts, the kingdom of God has come upon him. Then man sees God everywhere in his holy thought, in his holy action, in a holy manner. One aspect of love is not to associate someone with their sin. Always separate the person from the sin and to love them in spite of their sin. So basically hate the sin, love the sinner. You guys probably hear this in your parishes. Human thought without prayer is a curse for we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. The ideal of the true and perfect man was realized in the person of God-man with the God-human synergy. And the final page, the final note I have, which I will be reading after I'm done drinking, because we're reaching the end of this talk. What are our traditions? They are everything that the God-man Christ, He Himself, and by the Holy Spirit, gave the commandment to hold and to live according to them. Whatever he delivered in his church, in which he dwells continuously with his Holy Spirit, our traditions are our whole life in grace, in God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The life of us Christians which began in the Church of Christ, through the apostles, by the descent of the Holy Spirit, all of this life of ours is not from us, but from the Lord Jesus, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Or more precisely, our entire life is from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Thus, our traditions are the new life of the grace in the Holy Spirit, which is the soul of the church, the life in the eternal truth of God, in the eternal justice of God, in the eternal love of God, in the eternal life of God. Here, man is not creating anything, nor can he create the eternal truth, the eternal justice, the eternal love, the eternal life. But they are for him to accept, to change into his own, in Christ and in his church. All of these are given by the grace of the Holy Spirit to man are given and delivered, man is obligated to accept these traditions and to live according to them. Everything which was delivered to the apostles by the Savior Christ and the Holy Spirit constitutes exactly the tradition, the holy tradition, namely the whole teaching of the Savior and all of the life-giving energies for the realization of this teaching in the life of man. All of these were delivered to us, whether by word or by epistle, as St. Paul says, the tradition is in part written, while the most part was given orally, but all in common constitute the divine revelation, namely the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation given by God in the church for the salvation of the human race. From now and forevermore, the entire gospel was delivered to the church by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. And precisely for this, the gospel is the tradition of God in all of its broadness, the written gospel becomes complete with the unwritten gospel of the church and by it it is interpreted through the energy of the grace of the Holy Spirit which resides within the church. In reality, all of these in the church constitute one entirety, one living spiritual body, namely the written and the unwritten tradition. Therefore, as St. John Chrysostom says, tradition is to seek nothing more than, and I will add, than, than what it is given. Because in it is formed everything which is necessary for the salvation of men and for their eternal life in the present and in the future age. In one word, the divine, the God, human tradition is the deliverance through the centuries and the generations of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. With all of His divine truths and commandments, His mysteries and virtues as living God and Savior in the church and as the church. And this exactly is the church of Christ as His God, human body, namely the living and the holy tradition extended throughout the centuries, the eternally living God, man, Christ, and everything he has in himself and whatever he brings with him. I have exhausted all of my notes that I had so far. Thank you all for listening. So a good talk. I definitely recommend you reading this book. You should definitely go buy this book. Read it fully. There's a lot of good stuff that I missed out on that I didn't that I didn't talk about here. A lot of good stuff that you can check out for yourself. Having said that, now be sure to subscribe to my channel if you like this kind of stuff. 
thank you for staying so long. Donate to my Patreon if you can and if you want to. And I will say follow my Twitter, but my Twitter is gone. So I guess you have to subscribe to my Telegram now. Maybe that will be my Twitter page. No, no probably not. But again, thank you all for watching and listening to me. This has been David the Real Med White. And I will see you in the next video. May God be with you all.